innovations and creativity arising from the collaborative brainstorming efforts cultivate novel pathways towards the promising futures as shared ideas and experiences intertwine to form new trajectories. Good morning each and everyone present here. Welcome to the second day of MESCON 2024 International Conference Explore, Engage, Evolve, Navigating the Future in association with the Kerala State Higher Education Council, Trivandrum. The event is meticulously crafted to facilitate the exchange of innovative ideas, share research findings and foster collaborative initiatives. Once again, we welcome you to join us in the intellectual journey as we transcend boundaries, connect our minds and collectively contribute to the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom. Ensure your attention. Before starting the session, I request all of you to please switch your phone to silent mode. Today, the first session is handled by Smita J. Lucas, Assistant Professor, Department of Dairy Chemistry, VKIDF Team Manuti, Kerala, Veterinary and Animal Science University, Pukot. And introducing the chairs, Minsha KM, Assistant Professor, HOD, Department of Dairy Science and Technology. So, I would like to hand over this session to ma'am. Ma'am, please. On behalf of MESCON 2024, I am welcoming you all for today's session. I am delighted to introduce our esteemed speaker, Mrs. Smita J. Lukos. She holds the position of Assistant Professor at the Department of Dairy Chemistry, VKIDFT, under Kerala Veterinary and Animal Sciences University. Ms. Lukos embarked on a professional journey immediately after completing her graduation, working as a consultant to establish a quality control lab for an ice cream company in South Kerala. She pursued her post-graduation in dairy chemistry as an ITCAR candidate at the University of Agriculture Sciences, Bangalore. In 2003, she joined as a teaching faculty at College of Dairy Science and Technology, Manuti. From 2008 to 2015, she served as a vocational teacher in various, various regions of Kerala under the Higher Secondary Education Department. The, uh, during this period, she trained a group of 30 students. These students achieved first place at the state level among 350 schools in the highly competitive, most marketable category by, by providing, uh, 150, producing 150 milk and milk-based products for two consecutive years. In 2015, Ms. Lukos joined CDST Pukot Vainad as an assistant professor. She is also involved in setting question papers on diary related subjects for universities outside Kerala, KTU and Kerala PSE. Her professional affiliation include being a lifetime member of renowned organizations such as IDA and AFST. Ms. Lukos has made significant contribution to research and academic guidance. She has served as the major ad advisor for over 50 research students and as a minor advisor for 20 students. Her publication included popular articles and research papers in Scopus Index journals, exceed 20 in number. She has also held position as a special officer at CDST Pocode and currently serves as an assistant professor at VKIDFT since 2020. Of particular note is Ms. Lucas' PhD research, which tackled the pressing issue of micronutrient nutrient deficiency, a concern for consumers worldwide. Her groundbreaking work led to the development of a hypoallergenic whey protein supplement with enhanced iron bioavailability. With her extensive 20 years teaching experience, involvement in skill development initiatives and unwavering dedication to research, Ms. Lucas is the per perfect individual to provide an insightful perspective on the topic of the current session, milk and elixir or poison. Over to you, ma'am. Warm good morning to one and all. Thank you, Smimsha, for the introduction. I'm happy to see Smimsha after so many years. She was a student there at Kerala Veterinary and Animal Sciences University and I was a minor advisor. Send it, please. Okay. And now we are going to deal with the topic milk and elixir or poison. So this is a topic which is much relevant in the present scenario not only as a subject matter for a dairy technologist or a food technologist, but as a consumer, because it adds to your wellness and your health, isn't it? 
We know that there are, there are numerous cultures around the world and let it be any culture, milk is considered as a symbol of nourishment, as a symbol of purity and vitality, isn't it? And we know that milk is a complete food and that has a scientific evidence of course. There is scientific evidence for the fact that milk is a complete food because it contains all the nutrients. We know all those things we have learned in our basic classes. So I think all of all of you are food technology students, maybe. Isn't it? No? Others are also there? Okay, then I think I can explain a little bit on the basics. There is no problem. I think there is some disturbance with the mic. I'll just try with the cordless that we have proven that milk is a complete food but there is a belief among people that it is a healing liquid or a miracle liquid and that's why milk has cherished the heart of so many people isn't it and it has a close connection to the tradition of India also milk has a close tradition to uh, connection to the tradition of India it is an important ingredient in so many of the Ayurvedic preparations and of course it is used in religious ceremonies also isn't it and uh, I would like to tell a reference in the, even in the Holy Bible where God promises the people to a land which is abundant, abundant in everything and it is specified abundant in milk and honey. So we always hear that milk is in abundance means that is a sign of nourishment, isn't it? So this faith and science goes hand in hand with respect to milk. But what happened in recent days? That is the question. What happened in recent days? What we hear is facts and trends about milk. There is so much of abundance of information in the internet and social media which misguide us. It may be true, it may be a lie, and it may be a half-truth. And it is the half-truths that usually misguide us, isn't it? So this topic is relevant in this scenario, in this context, because of this reason. Okay, maybe there are some personal problems or personal illness for people, but we cannot generalize that milk is not good for everyone. That is the thing. So this content, we will just go to the topic and see what is the reality. And we will try to understand what a subject expert has to say about milk when so many people are telling so many opinions about milk, both, both negative. Even doctors are telling you should not consume milk. Recently, I heard a talk from a doctor, a famous doctor, who told that, uh, see, in olden days, the cows used to produce only three to five liters of milk. We know that. That's the statement made by the doctor. And now cows are producing 10 to 15 liters. How is that possible? It is sure that the doctor has no idea about the cross-breeding policy adopted by the government of India. Doctor is unaware of that, isn't it? Doctor is unaware of the breeds, what is the milk production. So such things are happening. So when a doctor says something, people think that it is correct. So it, this is the time to create awareness by subject experts, especially food technologists maybe, if there are like you, dairy technologists, to tell what is the reality and who should refrain from milk just because of some abnormal reasons. With that introduction, we'll go to the topic. And before going to the right into the topic, let us see what is the current status of dairy in India. We know that India is the first milk producer in the world with 221 million tons as against the world milk production of 935.9 million tons. You can see the increase in the milk production status over the years from 1951 to 2021, thanks to Dr. Verghese Kurian, the father of white revolution. I cannot prevent myself from, myself from mentioning the name of Dr. Verghese Kurian. And the annual growth rate is 5.3% in India as against 1.46 in the world. And you can see which all are the states that are producing more of milk or the availability is more. You can see Punjab with 1,181 grams per day. And you just see the case in Kerala, it is 189. So this is as against the... Uh, what do you say, the recommended intake of 280 grams by ICMR. We know that the recommended intake is 280 grams by ICMR and this is the present status. And now if you see the situation of different countries in the world, you can see that India is the first milk producer, followed by USA, China, Pakistan. And the map, you can see the different colors are given for the highest milk producers, lower milk producers, and you can have a look at that. 
and then milk production, the contribution of India is 20% to the total milk production in India, followed by US with 12% and European Union is together, all the countries in Europe together, European Union contributes to 20%. And the per capita consumption and population in the world, you can see the increasing trend. And the per capita availability, you can see it's only 117.7, that is the world average as against the Kerala average of 189. You have seen that, isn't it, in the previous slide. And now the, coming to the milk utilization pattern, milk is not utilized as liquid milk. Almost 48 to 50 percent is used as liquid milk and the rest as milk products. And there are other industrial applications also. In the preparation of cosmetics, in pharmaceuticals, lactose in milk is used as a filler in the tablets, you know that. And so many derivatives are there and it is used as an ingredient in animal feed as a protein source. Now coming to the health benefits of bovine milk, this is what a consumer knows. I hope this is what a consumer knows. And only this much, maybe. Okay. Consumer is well aware that milk is good for bone health and development, especially because of the high level of calcium, magnesium, vitamin D, all of which are important for strong bones and teeth. I will come to that later. Why milk as a source of calcium is much better than other calcium sources. There is a reason why as a source of calcium, milk is much better than other food items. I will explain that when we come to proteins. And then it supports muscle growth and repair because of the high quality protein. The term quality protein is very important. It doesn't matter how much quantity you are taking, whether it is quality protein and what determines the quality. We'll come to that in the coming slides. And milk enhances immune function and regulates blood pressure. And there is so much of work done on bioactive peptides, now hypertensive peptides, immunomodulatory peptides and uh, antioxidant peptides, defensive peptides. So many work is being done by the researchers now. And it, it is known to boost the immune system. Now this is a, a simple slide I have prepared on composition of milk. You name any nutrient under the sun that is there in milk. You know that there are only six nutrients, isn't it? All other subclasses of the six nutrients and all these six nutrients are present in correct proportion, that is balanced proportion in Milk, and that's the reason why it is said that milk is a complete food. And the major ingredients are carbohydrates, proteins and fats which are present in higher amount, that is in grams per 100 gram. Whereas minor ingredients are present in milligrams or micrograms like vitamins and minerals. And we know that the major carbohydrate in milk is lactose which is known as milk sugar because there is a no other known source of lactose in nature other than milk. Milk is the only known source of lactose and if you find lactose somewhere, it is sure that a milk product or a milk has been added to that. Okay. And when you say proteins, there are two different types of proteins in milk with entirely different properties. You cannot compare the property of casein with that of whey protein. Okay, casein has an entirely different property, entirely different structure and whey protein has a different structure and existence. When pro whey proteins are soluble, Caseins are colloids. Okay. Now this is the average composition of cow milk. And we need to remember these three because we'll be coming to that in detail later. The fat content of 3.9%. You keep that in your mind. Lactose 4.6% because people talk about lactose. Some of the negatives of lactose. And then protein 3.25%. Now the thing is that the composition of milk is not same for every species. And we know the reason for that. Why the composition of milk is not same for different species? Can you expect a cow to produce a milk with the same composition as that of human milk? No, because the requirement of different species is different. Energy requirement is different. The growth rate is different. Everything is different. So milk is a miraculous fluid, naturally designed. I will say that it is, a, it is designed by divine power so as to suit the requirement of the young one of that particular species. So by in itself, milk is complete. So if you are telling that milk is deficient in something, what we mean is it is not as per the requirement of a grown-up human being. That doesn't mean that milk is deficient in itself. Okay, it is complete for the growth of young one of that particular species. Okay. Now you can see a difference in the composition of different species. The reason why I have shown this is just to show the difference in the composition of 
human milk and cow milk. You can note that the protein content in human milk is only 1.6 as against 3.4 in cow milk. You know that a human baby doubles body weight in 6 months whereas a calf in 3 months. So naturally the protein requirement is more for a, such a species, isn't it? So we cannot say that human milk is bad because the protein content is less. What is the requirement and what is optimum? That only we need, isn't it? And now we can see the carbohydrate content in human milk is 6.98. You note that the lactose content is 6.9 to 7. And we talk much about lactose intolerance. A baby who consumes human milk is consuming 7% of lactose and is tolerating that and switching to cow milk. And the baby will definitely tolerate the lactose in cow milk because it is much lesser than the lactose in human milk. So that is a special physiological situation of some people who cannot tolerate lactose. We, we cannot generalize the cases of one or two people. So that this is the problem with social media. A person who is suffering from lactose intolerance, if he puts a post, we think that that is something general that affects the whole of the population. Isn't it? I have to tell something more in the coming slides about that. Uh, now coming to each and every nutrient, maybe you know all these basics. You must have learned in your schools maybe about protein, but not about milk protein. Isn't it? So milk protein is considered as a complete protein of high quality. How will you determine the quality of a protein? See, the performance of a team depends on the performance of the players, isn't it? So the performance of protein depends on performance of amino acids of which they are made of. A protein is made up of amino acids, isn't it? So when the amino acids are of good quality, so they're essential amino acids, you tell that the protein is of good quality. What if these essential amino acids are in a form that is not digested? It is of no use, isn't it? So the second thing is that it should be digested, it should be absorbed, it should be made bioavailable, and it should be made used by the body either for growth and development or for other physiological problems. That determines the quality of a protein. In that sense, milk protein is of high quality and there are certain constants which explains the quality of protein like biological value, net protein utilization, protein efficiency ratio. All these are constants with numerical values which give you an idea whether the protein is of good quality. Okay. And then it helps in growth. You must have seen in advertisements where a mother is telling, see, my son is drinking this drink and he has grown five centimeters and the other boy in the next house, he is drinking some other drink and he has grown only one centimeter. You must have seen that advertisement, isn't it? And so there is so much of protein in this drink and there is no protein in the other drink. So always protein is related to growth and development. And as such, milk is a complete food with protein, there is no need of adding all these powders to milk and increase the quality. As such, it has good quality. But people get the idea that there is something lacking in milk when such advertisements are shown. So they have to show such advertisements because they want to sell the product, isn't it? So you should be aware of such things. And then the intake of protein controls the total food intake. That's the intake of other nutrients will be reduced when you take sufficient amount of protein. And then the energy, you know, it is 4.2 kilocalories expressed as the large C. And casein, 80% of the total protein is uh, casein and 20% whey protein. I have written casein as a slow protein and whey protein as a fast protein. That is very, very important. Casein is a slow protein and whey protein is a fast protein. That means it is digested at a faster rate. You take protein and immediately there will be an increased level in the plasma, blood plasma in case of whey protein. Whereas if you take casein, studies were done separately. By separately taking casein, study, real studies were done. Whereas in case of casein, it takes time. But that is advantageous. Let us see how it is advantageous in the coming slide. That is because of the casein micelle structure. This is the structure of a casein micelle. You can see very complicated. It appears to be very complicated. There are different fractions, alpha S1, alpha S2, beta and kappa casein. All these are existing in the form of a micelle consisting of sub-micelles. I'm not going into the basics of formation of micelle because you must have learned that in your basic classes. How a micelle is formed, that is a long procedure. So much is there to learn. Uh, it is a surface phenomenon. When it reaches critical micellar concentration, it forms a 
micelle. Every emulsifier will form a micelle when it crosses the critical micellar concentration. And you can see there are calcium phosphate embedded in this case in micelle. So this is nature's miraculous mechanism in supplying calcium slowly, a slow release of calcium to the young one or whoever is consuming this cow milk. Okay, when micelle is getting digested slower, then whey proteins because of this structure slowly releasing the calcium. So this is the reason why the calcium and phosphorus from milk is considered to be more important than the calcium in any fruit or a vegetable. Okay, because there is slow release of calcium and phosphorus as per the requirement of the growing <coughs> baby or the growing infant or the growing calf. That's true. So that is the and the proportion of calcium and phosphorus in milk is same as the proportion of calcium and phosphorus that is there in bone. Unlike other fruits or vegetables or which are the sources of minerals. So that is the importance of casein as a source of calcium. And there are different types of casein. Alpha is one, alpha is two, beta and kappa casein. You cannot see beta here because there is so much of controversy about beta casein. You must have heard about A1 milk and A2 milk related to beta casein. I will explain that later when we explain the anti-nutritional factors or food fats. You just remember that there is something related to beta casein that people are marketing. Some entrepreneurs are marketing this myth related to beta casein without proper scientific evidence. It is not completely proven. You will see that in the coming slides. Now coming to whey proteins, there are so many whey proteins. I have shown only the major whey proteins, beta-lactoglobulin which contributes to 50% of the total whey protein, alpha lactalbumin 25%, then immunoglobulins and bovine serum albumin at a lower concentration. And you can see the composition of all these proteins together. I have just put a slide for you to understand. The alpha S1 casein and beta casein are almost of the same composition. And alpha S2 and kappa casein at a lower concentration, beta lactoglobulin. I have given a red color for beta lactoglobulin. You know why? Because when you compare the proteins in human milk and cow milk, the protein profile is different. One of the proteins which is there in bovine milk is missing in human milk. That is, it is not required for the growth of a human baby. And that is beta-lactoglobulin. So beta-lactoglobulin is a protein that is absent in human milk but present in bovine milk. Now that there comes, uh, you have a doubt there whether it is good for human beings. Okay. So something related to milk allergy or some antinutritional factor is there in and around beta-lactoglobulin which I will explain in the coming slides along with the anti-nutritional factors. And there are so many minor proteins. You can see a protein here, lactoferrin, which is an iron binding protein. People usually say that milk is deficient in iron, isn't it? But this lactoferrin is a protein which binds iron to a sufficient quantity that is required for the calf. Whatever iron is bound to lactoferrin, that is sufficient for the calf. Okay. So milk is not deficient for a calf, bovine milk is not deficient for a calf, but when we human beings are consuming that, depending on our age, when we compare with the RDA, recommended dietary allowance, maybe that much of iron is not there in uh, cow milk. Okay, because that is meant for calf anyway. But when you compare the different types of food available for us, the better one is milk because it contains almost all the nutrients in correct proportion in a bit digestible way. Now I have already told about how you will determine the protein quality. You always determine the protein by the estimating the nitrogen, isn't it? When you compare different major nutrients, nitrogen is present in protein and you always estimate nitrogen and find out how much protein is there. Okay, that is the basic principle. So you find out all these biological value, digestibility coefficient, net protein utilization, protein efficiency ratio, and you can tell which protein is better. And you know that milk protein has a higher value for all this, especially whey proteins. If you compare casein and whey proteins, you always talk about milk protein together, but if you are separating this, now products are available, casein products are available, whey protein products are available. If you compare these two, the better protein quality is for whey proteins. It has a higher biological value of more than 110. Okay. Well, the biological value of a reference protein is 100. But the latest score is protein digestibility corrected amino acid score. This is the acceptable one compared to all other scores. 
where it considers the limiting amino acid also. I'm not going into the details of limiting amino acids, which you are supposed to learn in your school, actually. That's why I'm not going into the detail. So that is actually, you will find out what is the limiting amino acid in a particular protein. You divide that with the reference protein, amino acid in the reference protein, and multiply with total digestibility, you will get the protein digestibility correct amino acid score. You can see the maximum score is 1. You can see it is the same as that of egg casing, whey, egg and milk, all of them have PDC AS score of 1, showing that it is a protein of high quality. And the easiness of consumption is for milk as it is in liquid form than when you compare to that of egg. Okay. And now here I have written that there is a secret super ingredient in breast milk that is alpha lactalbumin. In cow milk, 25% of whey protein is alpha lactalbumin. And that is the protein that predominates in human milk. Okay. So when you separate whey, that's the reason why you say that whey proteins are better for health. You must have read that. That doesn't mean that casein is bad. Okay. When somebody tells this is good, that doesn't mean that the other person is. Say, suppose your parents are appreciating the elder child, you are good. Does that mean that the younger is bad? And again, you need to remember that the whey protein that is absent in human milk is beta lactoglobin. And these are some of the products. I have shown only three. Some of the marketed products. And we know that whey protein is known for lean muscle development used by all these people who are going to gym for muscle development and all. Now coming to the nutritional aspects of milk, sugar, lactose, you know that it is a source of energy. And when you compare different species, you see that those animals which are fast moving, the milk contains more amount of lactose. Whereas in some of the animals, marine animals, the lactose content is zero. But they have more content of fat in the milk. So as I have told in the earlier slide, it is depending on the requirement of that species. For a marine animal or a an animal residing in cold environment, they need strong form of energy, not immediate energy. So they contain more of fat. And it contributes to, it is one-sixth as sweet as sucrose. So if you want a product in which you do not want much sweetness, you go for lactose that will increase the bulk of that product. That is an advantage. And then it is contributes to spoilage. You keep milk at room temperature. What happens? Microorganisms will enter. They want to multiply, they want to live, they consume the lactose as their food and they produce lactic acid as the end product. Okay, so it happens during the course of growth of microorganisms and the milk gets spoiled. That's what happens. So, in the it has both positive and negative effects. This is the very main reason why you are uh, able to prepare a large group of dairy products known as fermented products. And the microbiology people talk much about fermented products, probiotics and psychobiotics. They're known as psychobiotics now, all these pro probiotics, because some of these probiotics, like curd, yogurt, all these products are said to decrease depression. Studies are going on in that. And that is because of what? Because of the presence of lactose in milk. Lactose is converted by microorganisms to different end products. So unless and until there is lactose, there is no probiotics. Even doctors pres prescribe probiotics for you. If you have a stomach problem, Indigestion, constipation, IBS. Because of stress, so many people are having irritable bowel syndrome. And the doctor asks you, you take curd every day, and you tell lactose is not good. Send it. And it acts as an osmotic regulator. The osmotic pressure of milk is maintained. See, suppose milk contains so many nutrients in soluble form. What will happen? The cells will break. The mammary cells will break and burst. That's why I told it is a miraculous fluid properly designed. There is a divine power behind that. The osmotic pressure is perfectly designed. You see the casein micelle structure slowly releasing calcium and phosphorus. And there exists an interrelationship between lactose and all other components. Okay, we talk about lactose and minerals, there is an inverse relationship. So when an animal is suffering from mastitis, there is increased production of chloride in milk. Then as a natural mechanism, lactose content will reduce. Okay. And that during the production of lactose in Golgi vesicles, there is a large influx of water. So that influences the total quantity of milk and the concentration of other components. And alpha lactalbumin has a direct relationship with lactose. It is a protein that is involved in the synthesis of lactose. Okay. Alpha lactalbumin is a modifier of enzyme which helps in preparation of lactose. So there is a direct relationship between alpha lactalbumin and lactose. And now you remember the higher 
content of lactose in human milk and the higher content of alpha lactalbumin in human milk. Okay, when alpha lactalbumin is more, lactose production is also more. And now the preparation of the range of dairy products, probiotics is because of presence of lactose. And uh, lactose is a disaccharide, so it holds double the calorific value compared to a monosaccharide. So why milk is not designed in such a way that milk contains glucose? No, it is lactose. It is not glucose. Glucose is easily uh, digestible. But when milk is designed, was there a mistake? No, because it contains double the calorific value being a disaccharide, but the number of molecules will be same as far as osmotic pressure is Again, I, I think you remember what you learned in your plus two classes about uh, colligative property, osmotic pressure. Okay. And then milk, uh, lactose controls quantity and quality and it controls the texture, body and color of different products. Lactose is involved in Maillard browning. It is involved in crystallization. When you store milk powder and condensed milk, there are chances of sandiness. All these are because of lactose. And then Lastly, I have written something, intolerance of lactose for some individuals. Now you understood that intolerance is not a normal situation, it is an abnormal situation. There is a general trend that whatever is abnormal, we tell that that is normal. That is the, the, the trend of present generation. When you see something abnormal, you tell that that is normal and that should be considered as a separate entity. That is the general trend. Whatever is abnormal, that is always abnormal. Whatever is normal, that is always normal. Okay. Now coming to the nutritional aspects of milk fat, you know that milk, milk fat are esters of fatty acid and glycerol. This is not the time to tell the definition I know, but this is important because it's all about the fatty acids. The quality of a fat is all about fatty acids. That's why I told it is esters of fatty acid and glycerol. When you tell that the quality of a protein is all about its uh, amino acids and essential amino acids, the quality of a fat depends on fatty acids. What type of fatty acids are there? So rather than the total fat, what is more important is the type of fat, whether it is saturated, unsaturated, all those things. Then more than 99% of milk fat exists as triglycerides. And the fatty acids in milk are numerous, more than 400 different types of fatty acids are there in milk. And that's the reason why the unique flavor of milk fat cannot be duplicated by any other fat. Because milk fat is a blend of more than 400 different types of fatty acids. So when you remove milk fat and replace it with another fat, you will understand that there is something lacking in this product. That's what happens when you taste a frozen dessert and you taste ice cream. You can feel the difference between frozen dessert and ice cream because the rich flavor of milk fat is lacking in a frozen dessert. And we know that milk fat is a good source of essential fatty acids and it carries fat soluble vitamins. So fat soluble vitamins are very important for your health. We know that the government of India has uh, taken it up seeing that so many people are deficient in vitamin A and vitamin D and FSSA has made it mandatory that Milk should be fortified with vitamin A and vitamin D. So if you are not taking fat, then which component will carry the fat soluble vitamins? So you cannot completely avoid fat from the diet. Based on clinical trials, we will see that what the trials tell about consumption of fat, we will see in the coming slides. And then there is a milk fat globule membrane. I hope you know about milk fat globule membrane. We know that milk, I mean water and Fat will never go together. We are used to that statement, isn't it? Water and oil never go together. Milk is a liquid in which both water and fat exist together. So how it is made possible? Again, another miraculous intervention where fat and water is properly balanced by something coming in between which is appealing to both water and fat. That is nothing but milk fat global membrane with both hydrophilic and hydrophobic properties. Okay, and this milk fat global membrane is found to have antioxidant properties and so many other health benefits. It can reduce, it is found, reports are there uh, that it, it helps reduction of cancer and cardiovascular diseases. Now coming to the distribution of lipids, I would like to draw your attention to the free sterols. 0.2 to 0.41% and 10% of sterol is cholesterol. That means 0.02 gram, that is 20 milligram in 
1 liter. The, story. the cholesterol is only 20 milligram in 1 liter. And there was the American Heart Association has recommended 300 milligram per day. And in milk there is only 20 milligram. So it is well lower than the limit. Then why people are telling that cholesterol is a risky factor and you cannot consume milk? It has no base. Actually it is the saturated fatty acids that you should be concerned about and not the cholesterol content in milk. And just I have shown this structure for you to understand where these fatty acids come. You can see that this is glycerol. They are esterified at three positions with fatty acids. Fatty acid 1, 2, 3, shown as R, R1 and R2. So 99% of fat is existing in this structure. And all the 400 fatty acids come anywhere in this position in different combinations. Okay. All these 400 fatty acids, there are so many molecules like this. They come at different positions. And the total content of fatty acids influences the quality of that fat. Now this is the fatty acid profile of milk fat. And you should have a careful, you should show careful attention to this profile. See, up to stearic acid, it is saturated fatty acids. And from oleic acid, it is unsaturated fatty acids. Saturated fatty acids means there are no double bonds. And saturated means there are double bonds. It has some relevance, that's why I have shown this. Up to stearic acid, it is saturated. Okay, and here you can see all these are short chain, then you have medium chain, and then long chain. So the nutritional significance of each type of fatty acid is different, that's why I have shown this fatty acid profile. You can see here that 6% is 6% is short chain fatty acid. 19% medium chain and 42 long chain all together comes to around 65. You remember the figure, it comes to around 65. And then around 29% is mono, I mean polyunsaturated and monounsaturated together 29 and 4%. So it is it comes to around 40%. But that doesn't mean that all saturated fatty acids are bad. Let us see which all are good and which all are Bad. Now coming to before going to the anti-nutritional factors and the reason why people are accusing milk as to have a negative connotation, let us see the minor constituents. The minor constituents, we know that they are vitamins and pigments, you know, you must have learned so many times the advantages and disadvantages of vitamins, the deficiency disease, I think you must have learned it so many times, isn't it? So I am not going into the details of those. Then pigments are there, carotene in cow milk gives yellow color too. Come, we know that and in the way the color of the natural green color of whey is because of riboflavin. When you prepare curd at home and the whey separates, you see that there is a light green color because of riboflavin vitamin B2 which is highly nutritious and you should not drain it off. It's good if you drink that. You make uh, buttermilk or something, some parm and you can drink that because it contains valuable whey proteins. And then coming to the concentration of milk salt constituents you see this is the total amount of salt content that is seen in milk but what is more important is as i have told you earlier the whole amount of salt is not present as soluble components some are bound to casein as colloids you can see here out of the total calcium 66.5 percent is bound to casein that's why it is known as a slow protein releasing slowly calcium Phosphorus also you can see 57% is bound to colloidal case. Now you can see the minerals. In generally what are the advantages of minerals? It uh, balances the acid, it controls the acid base balance, electrolytic balance. All these things are controlled by the minerals and specifically calcium and phosphorus for bone development. Which you can see here. I am sure you must have learned all this also in detail so I am not going into the basics of all these things and you can see why some of the minerals and vitamins are having public health significance and some are not is there any criteria or is there any cutoff point to consider some minerals as to be very important and one less important that is the question you know that whenever the out of total population when less than five percent is suffering from some deficiency disease it is ignored Usually a country will ignore if the total deficiency is less than 
5%. If it is more than 9%, it is considered. The country will think that, okay, we have to do something about it because the progress of any country ultimately depends on the health of the people. The progress of any country ultimately depends on the health of the people and uh, specifically the health of young people. So everybody should stay young, isn't it? So that's the reason why government give recommendations, FSSI give recommendations to eradicate micronutrient deficiency by implementing fortification programs. So once the cutoff point is crossed, the country will declare it as a as of public health significance and some steps are taken. So as nutritionist, food technologists and dairy technologists, we need to intervene and we need to develop new innovation product thinking in this line. Fortification products. Okay. That doesn't mean that you just add so many things to milk and prepare a product. You need to assess whether it is bioavailable. That is more important. So most of the time students will complete their research just by adding something, they develop a product, they do sensory quality, okay, it is good. Do you know whether it is bioavailable? Do you know whether it is digested or it is excreted as such? No. So research will be complete only if you go for bioavailability studies, either in vitro or in vivo. Okay. And we can see that calcium is deficient in so many people are suffering from calcium and uh, this fortification with calcium is taken uh, is taken up in only some countries in Germany where wheat is fortified with calcium. Then there is iron. Milk is deficient in iron, we know that. And then uh, so many people are suffering from iron deficiency anemia all across the world as well as in India. So it is required to fortify and in India rice is fortified with iron but milk products are not fortified. I leave it to you, you can think why milk is not fortified now. And you can see the vitamins. I have just given the recommended dietary allowance of the age 9 to 13 and the content of these vitamins in milk. You can see that milk is a very good source of vitamins. If you consume, those who consume two glasses of milk or three glasses, that will provide the total amount of vitamins. In addition to that, fruits and vegetables, when they are consuming, that will give the total recommended dietary allowance. I know you know about fat-soluble vitamins. I have already told you cannot avoid completely fat from your diet, telling that fat is not good because vitamin A, D, E, and K are fat-soluble vitamins. The deficiency, see all these vitamins are required only in micrograms, but the deficiency will cause serious disorders. So you cannot neglect that. You have to take that. Even though in very low amount, you have to make sure that there is sufficient amount of these vitamins in your diet. And I have given the role of each vitamin. So again, I'm sure this you must have started learning from your school, maybe. Vitamin A, D, E, and K. And then what does FSSA say about all this? So, from 2016, October 16, it was made compulsory that when milk is marketed, it should be fortified and the logo, fortification logo should be there. And it should be fortified with 270 micrograms retinol equivalents to 450 microgram of vitamin A and vitamin D. And you can see in the bracket I have written 15% RDA. Why it is 15% RDA? This is to avoid toxicity issues and hypertoxicity problems. So usually what happens is in foreign countries, people take too much of supplements. And they are having toxicity problem, kidney failure, liver failure and so on. So they keep on taking so many supplements and it will be much higher than the recommended dietary allowance. So you should carefully take the supplements and when fortification is done, it is made mandatory by FSSA that it should be only maximum up to 15 to 30%. Maximum 35. Above that we will never. So when you are designing a product or when you are preparing a product, don't add the correct amount of RDA to that product. Okay, so many of you will be doing research. If 19 milligram is the RDA of iron, don't add 19 milligram to uh, 200 ml of milk and give for sensor evaluation. They will develop some toxicity. You calculate the 10 or 15 percent of the RDA, and then you and you substantiate that. See, FSSA has notified that like this much should be added, and this is how this is why it is fortified like this because you are taking these from other food items also, isn't it? Shown the results of National Family Health Survey done in 2019-21 in India and it was found that 57% of women are having iron deficiency anemia in India 
59.1% of adolescent girls are anemic. 31.1% of adolescent boys are also anemic. And 67% of children up to 59 months are anemic. So it is a it is a problem of public health significance. Severe public health problem is there in India. And when you take the case of the globe, overall the world, 33% of the people are anemic. So if you consider which is the major micronutrient deficiency all around the world, it is nothing but iron deficiency anemia. In India there are other cases also, I will come to that later. In India it is not only anemia, there is another problem also that is because of this misconsumption that Indians hear through the social media, there is a deficiency of another major nutrient. Can you tell what it, what is that? India is deficient in a major nutrient because of the misconceptions that is uh, circulated through social media. Can anyone tell? Hmm? It is a major nutrient. There are only three major nutrients. Okay. Okay, somebody is telling. I am not sure that is correct. So factors now let us see. When you say quality of milk, and when people say that milk is either an elixir or poison, you should have a clarity whether it is the inherent quality or the quality of deterioration because of intervention of those people who want to make profit. Both are different, isn't it? Those people who want to make profit, then they add something and make it bad and poisonous and you are making a general statement that milk is not good. There is no clarity in that statement. So the inherent quality of milk is good. That is proven. And now let us see why people think that milk is having a negative connotation. Okay. So we can see that which are the factors influencing the inherent quality. It is definitely the animal factors. How we are running the animal, how you are managing the animal. All these are important in the quality of milk. But only some components vary. Fat varies. But there are some components which will not vary, even if the nutrition is less. Especially with respect to minerals, calcium and phosphorus. That's the reason why you see some of the animals, soon after parturition, soon after giving birth, they just fall down. Do you know why it falls down? Because the milk is being synthesized in a perfect manner and the animal is undernutrished. And what happens? The milk is made in a perfect I have told you that it is not created by human beings. It is designed by a divine power. There will not be any shortcoming in the milk. So even calcium will be taken from the bones and the animal falls down because of, that is known as milk fever. The disease is known as milk fever. Same thing happens in a, every species also. There is no sufficient nutrients in the diet of the, that's why we give much care to pregnant ladies. It is required because there will not be compromise in the synthesis of milk except some variation in fat. A mild variation will be there in fat. Other than that, most of the components will be maintained in milk. So proper nutrition should be given to a mother. And then you can see these are the different factors which should be controlled in improving the quality of milk and then during processing some of the nutrients will be lost. When you go for heat treatment some of the volatile components may be lost. When you prepare a product you cannot tell that the product is actually as nutritious as milk. If you prepare paneer it is rich in casein. So it is protein and fat. The whey protein is you have drained off. So the nutritional quality is different. If you compare butter and ghee, the nutritional quality is again different. It is a fat-rich product. It contains more of fat. So you cannot expect the advantage of lactose in butter. Understood? So these things you should have a clarity. So when you choose a product, you should be very careful. Everything is not for everyone. That is a general rule, isn't it? Everything is not for everyone. So we should choose which product is suitable for me. If I have a personal illness, I have to choose accordingly. If I am okay, I have to choose milk so that I get all nutrients. Then intentional adulteration and unintentional contaminants, I have added this. These are the main reasons why the milk is considered to have a negative connotation because of the presence of adulterants and that again human beings are doing. It is not naturally coming. Human beings are doing that. They increase the quantity of milk by adding water. See, when you do one mistake, how will you cover up that mistake generally? You do a second one and you will cover up that, isn't it? So the same thing is done by those who are adulterating milk with water. They add water 
and they know that everyone knows about lactometer. We'll put a lactometer and we'll find out that water is added. So what they will do, they will add some other substance so that the lactometer reading is exactly the same. That leads to adulteration with other components in most of the cases. Understood? The reason for adulterating is to mask the addition of water. You do one mistake, you cover up with another mistake. And you do not have a cold chain, there is a development of lactic acid. There is no proper infrastructure, you add a preservative. And you try to neutralize the acid that is stored because of your lack of storage. You add some neutralizer. You are covering up your shortcomings by adding something and you are providing that to others and you are telling milk is a poison. And you see in social media some videos showing, let's see this color because there is neutralizer is there, that is the hydrogen peroxide is there, all these stories and you are telling, oh, we should not consume milk because it is full of poison. I still remember one of my students came and told me, ma'am, I read an article, beer is better than milk. She was a direct technology student. So I told her, you do one thing, I am preparing presentation topics for everyone, you can take that topic. Your topic is fixed. You present on, is beer better than milk? And I told her, when I come to meet you, meet your kid after your marriage, I will bring a bottle of beer for your kid. Okay, anyway, that is nutritious than milk. So, so such, even students who are learning, when you see something, you should think about that. Any rational individual should think whether it is correct. When I started my presentation, I told what a doctor told. Doctor is an experienced person in diagnosis and treatment, maybe. May not be a, an expert in milk and milk products or food and food products. Okay. And now, how will you assess the nutritional quality? Now, there are methods for assessing milk quality. There are so many tests, laboratory analysis, regulations are standards are now strict. Now let us see whether it is actually uh, because of the strictness of FSSA, it, what has happened after 2011. There, there are frequent surveys every 10 years on the safety and quality of milk and milk products. So let us compare the results of 2011 and 2018. Okay, I will show in one of the slides. Now what makes milk poisonous? Is it the anti-nutritional factors? Definitely no, because now we know that it is specific to a person. Say some people are allergic to milk. What is the definition of the term allergy? Allergy means an abnormal reaction to a component for which there is no reaction by majority of the individuals. Okay, that is the definition for allergy. So can you generalize allergy? The term allergy itself means that it is an abnormal reaction shown by, if you are allergic, you have an abnormal reaction to a component for which majority of the population is not having a reaction. As I have told earlier, a person who is allergic will, allergic will put a um, post in the social media showing all his rashes and uh, showing his throat and everything that I have developed allergy to milk. See, because of consuming milk, I have not taken any other food last one week and I took milk cow milk from Milma and I got this problem or cow milk from Amul, I got this problem. Understood? Hmm? So is it the anti-nutritional factors? Definitely no, but intentional and unintentional adult trends are causing a problem. Now coming to the anti-nutritional elements generally talked about people, the first one is lactose intolerance which I have already told. It is because of lack of an enzyme lactase which is produced by every individual in the small intestine. For some people it is not produced and there are different types of lactose intolerance, primary, secondary, congenital and developmental. Primary means as uh, uh, the person grows there will be a primary and secondary means when the person grows initially, when the, uh, the person is a small baby there won't be any problem because cow, human milk contains 7% lactose. Cow milk contains much less amount of lactase in cell. Due to some reason when the person grows the lactase uh, content decreases. Secondary means due to some injury, you are under treatment, you take antibiotic for your fever and when you take antibiotic, the lactase enzyme is not produced because there is some injury in the lining of the intestine. So at that time when you consume milk, maybe you will get a blood. And sometimes along with some Ayurvedic medicines, you are not supposed to take milk. I still remember that once my husband, he took an Ayurvedic medicine, the doctor prescribed this medicine and asked him to wash his... Uh, to 
regular washing of stomach gives one medicine. I went to college. I was not there. And what and the doctor told him after taking this medicine, your stomach will be clean and after that you should take only hot water. And the evening when I came, the whole neighbors, everyone were there, there was some serious medical situation happening there. You know what happened? There was milk in the kitchen. He thought anyway uh, something hot should be taken. He heated that milk and he drank that milk. And he was vomiting and so milk is not water actually. It contains 87% moisture. That doesn't mean that it is fully water because to digest the rest of the 12% total solids, the correct amount of water required is 87. If you are consuming, if the calf is consuming 100 ml of milk for digesting the 13 grams of total solids, 87 ml of water is required. Okay, so such things are there. So that doesn't mean that you should not take milk. Okay. Now coming to milk allergy, milk allergy is actually a common term used for lactose intolerance and protein hypersensitivity. But you should be knowing that it is a different. Milk allergy is, specifically speaking, milk allergy is uh, hypersensitivity against proteins. So as I have told you, a protein is made up of amino acids. Amino acids are not creating any problem, isn't it? We told that essential amino acids are there. So individual amino acids are not allergic, but when it forms a protein, there are 20 amino acids in different permutations and just like how you make a necklace with the different color beads. 21 different, all the proteins, your hair protein, food, everything is made of amino acids. Then why some proteins are allergic? Some sequences are allergic. Okay, some sequences of amino acid coming in a protein makes it allergic. Okay, so that is a hypersensitivity immune reaction to a protein and then saturated fat content. I told you to remember the name saturated fat. It is the saturated fat and the milk fat content is mostly saturated. 65% of milk fat is saturated which may contribute to high cholesterol and heart disease if consumed in excess. Now the question is what is excess? That will come in the coming slide. You will understand how much you can consume per day. I have made a calculation. This is what I have explained earlier. What is lactose intolerance? Human milk 6.4% lactose, bovine milk lesser than that. And see, when you, if you refer net and get information, you will see the data shows that more than 50% of the whole population is suffering from lactose intolerance. Do you know why it is said like that? 50 to 70% of the population suffer from lactose intolerance. That is the information you get when you search in the... Do you know why? Because, because lactose intolerance is tested by giving 50 grams of lactose in the store. In that particular test, the individual is given 50 grams of lactose and then they are testing whether the person is developing any intolerance. 50 grams means it is equivalent to one liter of milk. In the store. If there is 5% lactose in cow milk or 4.7, it is 1.25 liter, more than one liter of milk alone without taking any other food. So in actual situation, how we usually consume milk, we will never take one and a half liters together, maybe 100 ml, 200 ml, along with other foods we take. So in normal case, there won't be this intolerance. But as per data, the intolerance is very high because it is based on this test. Just like glucose tolerance test. I don't know whether you have undergone, any of you have undergone glucose tolerance. It is usually done after 40 years. If you are prone to diabetes, you will go for glucose tolerance test or when, during pregnancy period maybe. You take 50 grams of a packet of full glucose, you will be mixing in a glass of water, you will drink and you will check your blood glucose level. Understood? So this test is done in that way. That's why that shows that there is 50 to 70 percent of. And this data is used by some organizations, some people for selling their product. Understood? They want to sell some alternatives for lactose so they will manipulate those data and then most individuals show tolerance to small servings of milk so is the solution to avoid milk if you have lactose intolerance what is the solution and if you are avoiding milk what will happen that is the question and then there is another condition known as galactosemia that is intolerance to galactose lactose will be converted to glucose and galactose that is just one in 60,000 or one in one lakh incident. Now these are the top 10 countries and you can see it is 100% lactose intolerance. 
in the student. And this 100% is based on the other test. These people are given 50 grams of lactose at a time, together mixing, solubilizing in water and giving to them and uh, seeing whether they are having some nausea or vomiting or uh, these things. And the whole data is available in the net. If you want, you can just search and find out which all countries. In India, it is said that there is 50% lactose intolerance. That's the reason why people are misguided. When you see 50%, you think that if you drink milk immediately, you will get lactose intolerance. That is the problem. And now this is the mechanism. If there is no lactase in the small intestine, what happens? The lactose is not converted to glucose and galactose, as you can see here. It passes to the large intestine and just like how a waste bin, what happens, you are putting things in the waste bin, it will ferment and it produce gas, gas production. So that is the problem. And now what is the remedy? Lactose reduced milk is available, lactose free milk is available in the market, then fermented products. I have told you the whole story about probiotics. Okay, these fermented products, there will be less amount of lactose. And then lactase supplements are there because enzymes are available. You Take food, along with that people take lactase enzyme also. That also is there. Now coming to milk allergy, as I have already told, when studies are being done, actual clinical studies, when it was found that so many individuals are allergic to different types of proteins, even to proteins which are present in human milk also, some individuals are allergic. Okay, And uh, it has been found that alpha S1 case in beta lactoglobulin, alpha lactalbumin, bovine cerebral albumin, all of them will trigger to some extent some amount of allergy and don't forget that allergy is an abnormal reaction to a component for which most of the individuals do not have any problem. Don't forget that whenever you talk about allergy. And usually it is seen that this protein hypersensitivity is seen before three months of age or those people who are having a family history of allergy. And there are certain cases, rare cases where some people are having real serious allergy so they should not take milk as such, but it is the duty of a food technologist or a dairy technologist to provide a product with hypoallergenic property. They should Because they should not refrain themselves from taking the other nutrients which are present in milk, since milk is an almost complete food. And I have told you as far as protein is concerned, the allergy is related to a particular sequence. Amino acids are not allergic. When three amino acids come together, just like in a class, when three people are sitting together, they will be creating so much of problem. Then what the teachers will do? One person will be taken there, another person is allowed to sit there, and one person in the front row, then there is no problem. Okay. Similarly, when certain amino acids come together, that sequence will create a problem, an allergy. Okay. And what is the remedy for that? It is found that so many different processing techniques like heating, radiation, pressure, interaction with carbohydrate, like Maillard browning, all these are found to reduce allergy to some extent. But the most acceptable method is enzymatic hydrolysis and it was found that it could reduce 60% reduction allergenicity by 5% hydrolysis using the enzyme. This is my work, I have given reference, my PG work, which I have done 20 years before. I developed a hypoallergenic formula with a reduced allergy. The protein was hydrolyzed and allergenicity was reduced. And then you can go for combined, if the allergy is mild, you can go for the mild treatments and if the allergy is extensive you can go for such treatments like enzymatic hydrolysis. Now there are some similarities between lactose intolerance and allergy with respect to some of the symptoms. That's why people tell that milk allergy means they are not sure whether it is in lactose intolerance or protein hypersensitivity. You can see the similarities are in stomach pain, nausea, diarrhea, abdominal pain is common for milk allergy as well as for lactose intolerance. Whereas in case of dairy allergy, there will be skin rashes, hives. Hives means there will be itchy, um, there will be itching will be there and rashes will be there, it will be itchy also. Then swelling of lips and throat, trouble in breathing. Then lactose intolerance, there will be additionally gas or bloating, constipation and inability to, inability to digest. But you should be knowing the difference. Suppose a baby who is tolerating milk, who is breastfed, and you are diluting milk and giving to the baby and the baby is not having any problem means the baby is okay. If you develop some difficulty then you can suspect hypersensitivity of protein because baby can tolerate lactose. And if a baby who cannot consume cow milk, if you are giving curd then if it is okay then you can suspect 
that may be the risk might be lactose intolerance. Okay. Now I have told about the whole story of A1, A2 milk, how people are marketing products based on the A1 and the A2. And the differences in the beta case in two genetic variants. See, the only difference is at 67th position, when it is the amino acid proline, it is known as A2 milk. And at 67th position, when it is histidine, it is known as A1 milk. Okay. So the only difference in the sequence of in A1 and A2 milk is in the sequence of amino acid at just one position of beta casein. And there are 209 amino acids in beta casein. So just, at, just like I have given an example before, certain students when they are sitting together they will create a problem. There is much difference. When they are alone they have a different behavior. When they are together they are just like that. Don't think that just because of a position of one amino acid it is one and the same. No. There is so much difference in the properties of these two uh, genetic variants. But there is no evidence. So far, there is no clear evidence whether one is good or the other is bad. Okay, there is no evidence. Still studies are going on. But it is believed. And you know, there is A1 and A2 ghee in the market. <coughs> what is the sense behind A1 and A2 ghee? Is there protein in ghee? Is there protein in ghee? Yes or no? Is there protein in ghee? No. A1 and A2 is completely dependent on the sequence of amino acids in a protein. And a product like ghee is marketed with at a 5 or 10 times higher price. A2 ghee is marketed. So such things are happening. And now coming to milk fat and cardiac health. This is of much interest to so many consumers. Whether milk fat is good for health or not. And this is the leading global cause of death with 17.3 deaths per year all over the world because of cardiovascular diseases. <coughs> now milk fat is not a rich source of cholesterol. We know that we have seen in one of the previous slides how much of cholesterol is there and how much can be tolerated. Okay. Now unsaturated fatty acids are found to bring about desirable changes in blood cholesterol. See some of you have done, if you have checked your lipid profile, then there will be LDL cholesterol. If you have checked, you know that there are so many parameters, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, total, all these are checked. And LDL should be LDL should be less and HDL should be more. Good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. So only if you consume sufficient amount of unsaturated fatty acids, there will be sufficient amount of HDL. Okay. So you cannot say to that you should avoid the whole amount of fat. And now consumption of milk and milk products are good for cardiac health with, with respect to the conjugated linoleic acid and other components like calcium and biopeptides. So you cannot avoid milk completely because there is some amount of saturated fatty acids. We need to see how we can manage the diet with respect to fat rich products. That's what we should learn, isn't it? Now the saturated fatty acids of milk are within safe limit. Okay. That is true or not. I am making a statement that it is within safe limits. I will show a calculation in the next slide. Then you will understand whether it is within safe limit. So in the light of above, blaming milk or dairy products as atherogenic is not just. Atherogenic means there will be deposits of fat in the lining of the different linings of uh, the body. Now the total fat intake was highest in a place called Crete in Greece. That is 43% of the total calories they have taken as fat. And the lowest incidence of cardiovascular disease is reported in Greece. That is in Mediterranean countries, <coughs> there is lowest incidence of cardiovascular diseases. They are taking 43% of the total calorie from fat. Along with that, of course, they are taking fruits and vegetables also. But the total out of total calorie, this much they are taking. It is many go deeper into that study. I have just put a statement from the study. When we go deeper into the study, we, find, we see that they are consuming more of unsaturated fatty acids. They are consuming more of unsaturated fatty acids. And see, this is the recommendation for intake of cholesterol was earlier, I can say that only earlier, less than 300 milligram per day. And now the American Heart Association is not giving any recommendation. Okay. After 2023, August 25, the American Heart Association is not giving any recommendation. They're telling you can consume any amount of cholesterol. There is no problem. That's what the Heart Association is telling. Okay. 
and what they are insisting is when you take consider the total amount of energy from calories the from saturated fat it should not increase to more than 10% and we have already seen that in Greece they are taking 43% percent is not it in Greece they are taking 43% And I have again shared the fatty acid profile for you to remember the fatty acid profile of milk fat, which comes to around 60% saturated fatty acid. Again, there is a problem. A study was done comparing the effect of lauric, meristic, palmitic, and stearic acid were given to four different groups of people, and they were studied for eight years. And it was found that the incidence of cardiovascular disease for stearic acid group was much lesser than that of palmitic acid. Okay. So again, there is confusion. It is the result of an actual clinical study. Stearic acid is a longer saturated fatty acid than palmitic acid, and you expect that it is more dangerous, isn't it? But the clinical study proved that the incident was much lesser than that of palmitic acid. And later it was studied and it was found that the stearic acid triggers removal of unwanted cholesterol from the body. It acts as a biomarker and it gives a signal to the liver asking to remove the unwanted long chain fatty acids. Understood? So that is the scientific basis what they have explained. So again, we will have to reduce the palmitic acid, stearic acid from the total 65%. Isn't it? We need to reduce 14.6 from 65. Then it comes to 50. Okay. Then again, there are short chain fatty acids saturated here which are not found to pose any problem. Butric, caproic, caprylic, and capric acid are at SN3 position easily digested and removed from the body. Again, you need to reduce that. Okay. So you cannot tell that the total 65% of saturated fatty acid is dangerous. And again, studies are going on also. So this is a calculation which I have made for you. If it is useful to you, then you can change your diet from today onwards. You consider a person consuming milk equivalent to 500 ml means one packet. One packet is sometimes 425, 450 or 500 depending on the brand. You have to check it. Suppose a person takes 500 ml with 4% fat, then what is the saturated fat? If it is 65%, it is 12 gram. Okay. And if it is 50%, as I have told, removing the stearic acid, it is 8 gram. And the calories from saturated fat will come to 108 then. If the person takes a normal human, depending on the work you are doing, the total calorie intake varies from 1,000 to 3,000. So if you are doing a hardworking person, those who are working in uh, physical, so much physical activities involved, the calorie intake will be more. So normal person with 2,000, the saturated fat intake recommended is 200. And a person who drinks 500 ml, will get 108 calories from saturated fat. That is only 50%. Okay. And if the stearic acid is excluded, then it comes to only 56, only 4 and 4. That means you can take some other type of saturated fatty acids also along with that. But to be on the safer side, 1 to 1.785 liters maximum can be taken if the whole saturated fatty acid is from milk. So you need to plan your diet accordingly, but when you go for a fat-rich source or a concentrated form of lactose, what is your choice is very important. If every day you are taking 10 spoons of butter, then definitely you will have a problem. You have the habit of taking bread and butter every day morning, and you take 12, 6, uh, 15 slices, and to every slice you are adding one full spoon, then definitely you will have a problem and don't blame, because your food habit is not proper. Okay, so you should plan accordingly. Now the new recommendation is that cholesterol is no longer a risk and eating too much saturated fat along with sugar and sodium and too little fiber raises the risk of heart disease. So avoid HFSSs, high fat, sugar and salt products is the, uh, it is written in the outside the label but you should know that saturated fatty acid is causing all this problems then why the dietary advice keeps on changing because scientists learn stuff on one side and there are some people who want to market their product that is also there then scientific research on specific nutrient is shifted to totality because when you do a research you give only that component you never consider the interaction of different components so you may get a, a wrong result 
Now just for you to understand, I have just put some of the references based on the studies based on which all these findings were made. Okay, the Wordsworth Hospital, what they did is they did a study of eight years on those who are on 65 years. They changed some amount of saturated fat to unsaturated fat rate. There was 31% reduction in cardiovascular incidence. In another study, 29% reduction in the mental hospital. In India, this study is very difficult to do study in human beings. We do not have much. The ethical issues are very high. But we can see that in other countries, they are doing so much of study, extending to eight to six years. In the second study, actually, it is done at home. They gave an awareness, just how I am taking a class for you. An awareness class was given to this 142 men and they were asked to change the diet accordingly by replacing saturated fat with unsaturated fatty acid and they studied for six years. Based on that study, it was found that there was 29% reduction in that. Nowadays, we hear that so many people are um, on the spot they are dying, isn't it? On the spot deaths you are hearing nowadays. And we don't know what is the reason. So you have to definitely plan your diet accordingly. And so the remedy is a replace saturated with unsaturated fatty acid. So don't take, to be safer side, don't take more than 20 gram of saturated fat. Okay, better not to take more than 20 gram. But if you are taking once in a while, it's okay. You are going outside and you all, all these junk foods, it contain more of saturated fat. There will be some cheese or something stuffed inside, mayonnaise will be there, so many things will be there. So maybe if you are regularly taking such types of foods with butter, you will be taking more of this. And what is more dangerous is, I did not tell about that, that is trans fatty acid. Due to some processing techniques, repeated uses of oil, there will be trans fatty acids which will cause cancer. Now, strategy in selecting fat-rich products, you will have unsaturated fatty acid, you limit saturated fatty acid, and you lose or avoid trans fatty acid. That is the golden rule. Just to show what is center, just a change in stereo position. That is the centrance, but that makes a major difference. And now, there is a protein per se that Indians have never understood. If I do not tell that, then uh, I think it will be incomplete. There is a protein puzzle which Indians have not understood because the protein malnutrition cases are very high in India just because we avoid protein-rich sources as we are misguided by some of the information in the social media, especially milk and milk products. There is so much, the protein nutrition is very high. That is 67.7% of Indian population is undernourished. There is standard growth of 48% for kids under 5 years and are underweight, 42.5% are underweight under 5 years because protein is not properly taken. And we know that Indian diets are mainly containing carbohydrates. Okay, so there is a puzzle related to that protein which you should properly manage. That doesn't mean that you should take only protein together. Okay, you should manage your diet properly. And globally, it's less than 1.5%, but that's not a small number anyway okay when we globally when you analyze 149 million children under 5 and 45 million are having undernutrition the number is big but the percent is less okay number is big means when you consider the percentage number of people you have to consider it seriously and the world health organization aims that by 2025 everybody should have good health and wellness now what are the real challenges actually faced in dairy industry and food industry, it is the cost of production, lack of cold chain infrastructure, and the unorganized industry, and as I have told, adulteration. These are the things. And now I will uh, show some of the slides. It will be, I'll be moving very fast from now onwards. Within 10 minutes, I will finish. Don't worry. Uh, this uh, adulteration in milk is one of the problem which says that milk is poisonous, isn't it? So let us try to understand what is meant by adulteration. When article is sold by a vendor is not of the nature, substance or quality demanded by the purchaser. Once when I gave a training to assistant directors, one person asked me, ma'am, uh, by adding water, water is uh, life-giving substance and if you are adding water to milk, what is the problem? What is the need to give this much of injury? The thing is that it is not of the quality demanded by the, it is cheating. 
you promise that you are giving milk and you are giving water. Okay, you promise that you are giving milk and you are giving water means that is, you cannot consider it as something small. Okay, so the, we know that the most, as I have told earlier, the most common adult trend is water and to mask that some other adult trends are added to increase the SNF content and preservatives for preserving when there is no proper coaching, neutralizes for neutralizing the acid that is already developed. And then you will understand, when you prepare milk products, you will understand that neutralizer cell. Once it happened that I was taking practicals for the students and I took milk, the product was funnier. Even after adding any amount of acid, the milk was not getting coagulated. And I was thinking what to do now. We have taught the whole theory to the students and everybody is waiting and then I told them, you do one thing, you take a, do a neutralizer test. 5 ml of milk was taken, rosalic acid was added and then there was pink color showing that neutralizer. That was a well-known brand in Wayanad. I will not tell the name of the brand. That was a well-known brand in Wayanad. I was working as a special officer there at Pukod at that time. So it happens. Now next is, when we talk so much about adulteration, you should know that the National Milk Quality Survey was done in 2011 earlier and later in 2018. And when it was done in 2018, the good news is that for Indian consumers, 93% of the samples showed that it is safe for human consumption. Whereas in 2011, only 53% of the samples were safe for consumption. So that change is there since the regulations are strict. There is a checking at check post, there is a severe checking now. So many checkings and most of the adulteration happens in village areas or local people who are selling milk and not in the organized sector because it is very strict now. Now the non-compliance was mainly seen for fat and SNF and the maltodextrin and sugar, they do not pose safety issues and then one of the major finding was the presence of aflatoxin M1 residues beyond a permissible level. And this aflatoxin M1 was not tested in any of the previous surveys. There was no developed method for testing that. In 2018 when it was tested, it was found that there is, and it comes from the feed actually. It is not an intentional adulterant. It is an unintentional adulterant which comes especially from maize. So now what is in our university, what is done is before giving the, preparing the feed or the formulation, the maize is tested for aflatoxin. And if it is below permissible level, then only it is used for preparation of feed. So such things are being done in, mainly in organized people, they will be doing that. For local people, I don't know to how, what extent they can do that because it is costly. To test for aflatoxin, I think it is 700 rupees for one sample. And now there are FSSA accepted tests based on so many references. I just showed the references. If somebody is interested, you can know that it is based on so many studies that these tests were designed. And this is the punishment for unsafe food. As I told you that somebody asked me, if you are adding water, yes, 1 lakh rupees and 6 months imprisonment if it is adulterated, even if it, if it does not cause any injury, this is the punishment. And if it is non-serious injury, one year of imprisonment and three lakh rupees. Failure results in serious injury, six years imprisonment, imprisonment and five lakh. Failure results in that seven years and ten lakh. But you know the main problem is it is difficult to prove that the milk is adulterated. The main problem is it is difficult to prove that either they will tell you did not do the test properly or they will tell you did not take the sample properly. Because I know some of my students, they are working with food safety department, they tell me it is very difficult. Once they prove that they take video right from taking the sample and even then they will tell, uh, it is not proper, it is uh, done like this and it is very difficult to punish them. That is the main problem with this. The only thing is you can create awareness. Isn't it? People become behave in an ethical manner, either they have an awareness, they know that they should be like this. If they are not doing like that, what we will do? We will give a punishment and we make them do. But they will always find loopholes unless and until they have an awareness. Now just for detection of, we know that the different methods. I am moving it very fast. There are color tests for finding out the presence of all these adulterants, presence of sugar, presence of glucose. I think uh, there is no need to explain this, isn't it? Svensha, I can just go faster. You will get all these from, uh, if you search in net, you will get this. These are the, you know, these tests were done in a lab and I have taken photographs. 
detection of starch, the neutralizers, we can see that the color development is there for positive test. And the main drawback of all these tests is that the negative sample will show a mild color in some of the tests. So then you will be confused. That's what, that is the main drawback of some of these tests. And then alkalinity of ash confirmation test is there. Detection of formalin uh, test is there. You know that formalin is added as a preservative in so many other products like fish also. Strips are developed and in our department also we have, we are developing research is going on developing strips using which you can easily identify the presence of these preservatives. And her test, leach test is used for detecting the presence of, then for detecting hydrogen peroxide, then sodium chloride, See, all these are cheaper components available at home. So farmers, what they do, they add water, they add some salt, maybe some sugar. So if you you, are, you get a positive test and you tell them, see, there is sugar, then they will tell, oh, ma'am, actually what happened is one glass of milk was kept for the kid. <coughs> kid did not take that, so we added that to the whole lot and it happened. So we give a warning and send them. And when it, repeat, when it happens repeatedly, then only we can give a punishment. Okay, because unless and until we give an awareness, we cannot tell that, we cannot punish. Isn't it? First we should create awareness, and then they, if they are violating, then only you can punish. Now, so the purpose of showing all these slides is to make you know that there are so many tests. And this is the reason why in the National Safety and Survey, the incidence has reduced. Because when we take classes like this to farmers, they know that there are ways to find out this and we show the demo also to them. Then they ask us, some of them ask us, ma'am, to how much amount you can detect? See, even better than a student, they know which is the least detectable limit. If I ask a student in Viva what is the least detectable limit using this test, they don't know the answer. But if I ask the farmer, farmer knows what is the least detectable limit. Because that is his life problem, isn't it? So he learns how much he can add so that it is not detected using a test or a lactometer. Now natural and synthetic, nowadays synthetic milk is not uh, that much in the market, but it's easily detectable. You can detect the presence of urea and find out what is synthetic milk. And then milk products also, now the FSSA has amended and it is uh, made compulsory that gas chromatography should be done to find out the fatty acid profile. So now it is very much difficult for the farm, for people who are marketing ghee. They have to do GCMS. Before they had to do some simple tests. Now they have to go do GCMS and they should write in the label that this is the fatty acid profile of ghee to make sure that it is not adulterated. And there are unintentional adulterants which are causing problems like heavy metals, pesticides, antibiotics. And some of the unidentified adulterants are also there because sometimes people come with some samples and ask us to find out what it is. And we are it is very difficult for us to find out what it is. They give this and they tell, we went to uh, Karnataka, we went to Tamil Nadu, there they are adding this powder to milk and milk is becoming more viscous. Please tell us what it is. And they will bring um, some powder and we'll analyze and we'll tell under which category it falls. So unknown adult trends are there. And I will, I'm going to finish with one or two, within one or two slides. These are the tests done in our lab. We have developed a test. I cannot reveal the reagents because we have given for patent. That's why I have written reagent 1 and reagent 2. We have applied for patent to identify adulteration of goat milk with cow milk. Milk is marketed as goat milk, but we are not sure whether it is goat milk. So there was an inquiry in our department whether you can find it. So we developed, one of our students did research and we developed a method. And I cannot reveal the reagent anyway. It was done in the chemistry department, VKDFT under Dr. DVMP. And again, uh, there was a news in Hindu newspaper that paneer was prepared by adding, using sulfuric acid as coagulant. Then again, we took up a research related to that to find out whether the, what is the acid used and the method was developed again in our department. A violet color will be shown, uh, the procedure is given. And then we need to understand then what is all about value addition. If milk is complete, if everything is there in milk, then what is all about value addition? Why do we talk about value addition? That's the question, isn't it? Value addition means you are adding value to something that is having lesser value, isn't it? 
So what this value addition is all about is providing appropriate nutrition to targeted population, or as I have told, those people who are having some intolerances, we are doing research and we are providing products so that they get all the benefit of all other components, and we are tailoring that particular component, just like what a tailor does. The tailor will cut the cloth according to your requirement, isn't it? Hmm? If it is not, if it's a ready-made dress, I don't know. But if you are tailoring, some people are very specific that it should, should perfectly fit for you, isn't it? So we are tailoring some of the components in milk. That's a research all about in value addition. And some of the, uh, I have just written the name, those who are lactose intolerant, those who have IBS syndrome, gut health, you can suggest probiotics. For milk allergic subject, uh, subjects, hypoallergenic milk-based products can be suggested. Heart patients or with high cholesterol, you suggest skim milk and fat reduced milk and polyunsaturated fatty acids. To address micronutrient deficiency incidents like night blindness, anemia, or osteoporosis, you can suggest fortified products. And people are not even aware of some of the probiotics. Yesterday when we came to the, reached here at night, and on the way I asked the cab driver that uh, we want to purchase yogurt. Then he asked what it is. He doesn't know what is a yogurt. So that awareness is still, we need to give awareness among people about these products. And just I have added some of the photographs of my PhD research work, how I developed a iron fortified milk product. What I did is I bound iron to protein because you cannot fortify milk with iron. There will be an off taste. So I developed a procedure in which I prepared protein bound iron and prepared a product and this is the, these are some of the photographs. Again, I cannot reveal it fully because my thesis is not available in the uh, free access. It, it is yet to come. And this is the sensory panel doing the sensory evaluation. And then bioavailability studies. As I have told, whatever product you develop, you have to do bioavailability study on animals. My study was, uh, I did on Vista rats, and the hemoglobin shooted up to 14 after giving this for six days. After giving the iron fortified protein powder for six days, the hemoglobin was as high as 14. So this is the kind of value addition studies we need to think about. Okay, considering what is the problem in society, we have to find a solution as a food technology. Since I am an expert in dairy, I have told about dairy, but you are all experts in, some of your experts in food technology, isn't it? So you also should find out solutions for this and uh, create awareness among people about all this misguiding information given in the net. And this is the metabolic study done at VKDFT. This is a cage designed in our department. The metabolic cage available in the net was very costly, so we ourselves designed a metabolic cage and we did the research. And in this, um, here it is not evident. You can see the eyes of the rat is red in color. Uh, when I got a higher hemoglobin for this group of rats whom I fed with, I took a photograph of the eyes. I don't know whether it is visible in this. Uh... And coming to the conclusion, we are sure that milk is an uh, elixir, of course, considering its inherent composition. It is a balanced food, it is a complete food. And it is there are irreplaceable nutrients in milk, but what we need to consider is it is available, there is, it is deficient in iron with respect to a grown-up, a person who is consuming. We need to provide such value-added products. And considering the people who are suffering from intolerance of lactose, hypersensitivity, cardiovascular diseases, we need to decide, uh, design products suiting to their requirement. And with that, I conclude. Thank you so much for listening patiently. I have taken, I'm sorry for taking extra time, I think. No, we started late, isn't it? Yeah. Content and decontent, what fortified milk is better. But, uh, <clears throat> see, if you are considering the exact nutritional quality of the natural ingredients or the natural composition, uh, you need to see to how much temperature it is heat treated. So 
So if it is as much as the pasteurization temperature, you are not compromising the quality of the ingredients. But at home, if you are boiling that, usually we do not believe the packaged products, isn't it? Even if it is pasteurized. In foreign countries, they directly consume pasteurized products directly from the packet. But in India, since so much of adulteration and all these things are there, we do not believe and we again go for boiling. And what happens is some of the volatile components are lost. Some amount of proteins are denatured. But now, considering the public health significance, it's better to go for fortified vitamin A and D fortified products. And it is made compulsory, actually. This is has made compulsory that it should be fortified. Uh, recently, North Indian side, for milk in the product, milk in the ladder, and the pressure made in the way diet and the chanagam, bedlam, mixed it, filed the good, and the good lakarum. We mixed with, is there anyone who cannot understand Malayalam here? Or not from Kerala itself? Okay. Since the question was in Malayalam, I will ask in Malayalam. In Malayalam, it is fecal matter, excreta, milk, and milk. If they are adding that, that will be for profit. Profit-oriented activities cannot be supported. We are supporting only quality-oriented uh, activities. Now to find out, we, the test that can be done is for nitrogen. Urea testing. Yes, nitrogen testing. Because uh, milk protein is uh, defined. Like, once it happened that Nyangada Nyangada College department he said it is cow milk. Cow milk gave a fat test. So we have to cow milk in the fat to exotic breed. If you go to a foreign country and we grow an exotic breed, maximum fat content is just around 5.5. If it is buffalo milk, it can go up to 10%. So cow milk in the naturally we know what is the fat content. We got 7%. And he is shouting. Actually, he, we think that he did some adulteration and he wanted to know whether we will find it out. So, we don't have to worry about it. Offense is the best form of defense. So, he is telling me what is this result. Then I told him, okay, you do. He said, I will go to the case. You will go to the lab and test. Then I told him, you go and register a case. So that you will be caught. What we did is we made a format in the manner specify the NIT order to call on addition at which species of which breed of milk is given or is it crossbred. So that I think later Alvaran he will tell that there was this buffalo milk. Okay, such cases are also there. Some of the people come for training in college to know whether we can find out an alteration. So, we want to reveal certain things. We want to reveal certain things. We know if the intention is good, they are going for a good quality product, then we will definitely help them. We give consultants. Definitely. Because the content of excreta is different. Urea and uric acid, ammonia carriculum. Fiber will be more. Milk will be fiber. You will get 0% fiber. We can use fiber to get rid of it. I invite Dr. Mohamed Rafi, sir, HOD, Department of Commerce and Management Studies, to hand over certificate and token of love to Smitha J. Dukos, ma'am. extend my sincere thanks to our esteemed speaker, uh, Dr. Smitha J. Lupo, uh, for sharing valuable information about the topic milk, milk and elixir or in poison. Um, thank you, ma'am. And the way she delivered the uh, topic was uh, simply brilliant. And I also thank uh, Sh uh, Shejin sir uh, for taking time to join us uh, today. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, I 
extend my uh, heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed principal, Dr. Sri Rajesh, uh, and uh, department conference coordinator, uh, Smincha KM, and venue coordinator, Preeta Ma'am, and also the conference coordinator, Mustafa Sa, for their uh, sincere and dedicated efforts uh, uh, on behalf of this uh, MESCON 2024. And I also thank uh, all of you for your active participation uh, for this uh, conference and for making this conference uh, a successful one. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you so much.